We found you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dan Nathan. This is Guy Adami. This is Liz Young. Guy and I are partners, Risk Commercial Media. We also are on CNBC's Fast Money most nights at 5 p.m. Eastern. Liz is the head investment strategist at SoFi, where you can get your money right <laughs> all in one app. That's right. Um, this is a live recording that we do every day at 1 p.m. Liz joins us on Thursday. She also joins us on the On The Tape podcast that drops what? In the podcast stores every Monday. Favorite podcast store. In your favorite podcast store every Monday and every Friday. Um, so we are here to do something uh, a little different than some of the other panels that you guys have seen today. Um, a lot of the focus has been obviously on consumers and on marketing. We're going to look at the markets through the lens of the consumer. Um, a lot of our audience who tune in, they tune in to us for, um, you know, just the sort of market commentary that we do on CNBC. Liz is also on CNBC a whole heck of a lot on the halftime report with the, um, the folks there. And you also do the closing bell. So let's get into it. Um, you know, the markets have in the last couple of weeks started to get, or at least pay attention mm -hmm. guy to the rise in interest rates, something that I think a lot of market participants over the last, call it two decades, have gotten very used to being very low. But interest rates have come up very fast, okay? And they're doing that to combat inflation, okay? That's been caused by a whole heck of a lot of reasons. Why is the start, stock market in particular started to pay attention to the rise in interest rates? And they've been going up for 18 months. They've just gone up kind of quickly um, in a very short period of time. Yeah, it's great to be in a low interest rate environment, which we enjoyed for the better part of 15 years. Valuations, the amount of money you will pay for a dollar's worth of earnings really don't matter all that much. People are willing to sort of pay up for things when money is free and they're looking for homes. You're looking to sort of park your money somewhere. And quite frankly, um, things don't necessarily matter when they should matter in a higher interest rate environment. Now we've moved from a zero interest rate environment for the better part of a decade and a half to five and a quarter percent ish. And we've done it over a very short period of time, historically fast period of time. And although we've endured interest rates at these levels many times in the history of the country, we haven't endured them in the speed with which we've gotten here. So it's not the rate necessarily, it's the rate of change. And I think the market is coming to grips with that now. And more importantly, I think consumers are coming to grips with that now. They've enjoyed this low interest rate environment. They've been able to buy things. Now, when you're buying things on credit, it actually costs money to do so. Yeah. Liz, talk to us a little bit about um, the dynamics of the last few years. So before they started, the Fed started raising interest rates, money was free. People couldn't travel. They couldn't you know, go and do a lot of the things they were doing. So we saw this huge explosion in goods, right? Like, like, and, and then we saw all of these weird bottlenecks in the retail sector over the last, call it 18 months or so. And we saw this transition from an interest in goods to an interest in, in services and travel. Like now that's slowing down a little bit. So talk to us a little bit about the pull forward we saw during the pandemic. Um, and now what we've seen I guess we can call it post pandemic, but in this higher interest rate environment and what that has meant for consumer spending, because Guy will remind you on our pods quite frequently that our economy, you know, two thirds of our GDP is powered by consumer spending. Yeah, a little more than that, even 70%. Yeah. So I, I think over the last, well, I'll call it three years, we started with this all the goods demand that happened because we were stuck at home, everybody bought stuff. And then you had this kind of whack-a-mole problem. Used car prices went up and we were worried about that. Then they went back down. Then we were worried about food prices. Then a war broke out and we were worried about oil prices and so on and so forth. And then when we were allowed to go back outside again, suddenly it was this huge burst in demand to go do stuff, which is where travel came back, concerts came back, all the events, everybody was so excited to spend on services and restaurants. I don't know that this is yet a pullback in spending more than it is just like going back to normal spending, mm -hmm. right? Because we had such a big burst. That drove inflation, obviously, and the shortage of not only availability of goods, the shortage of workers to provide these services drove inflation, which is why we find ourselves in this position today. The consumer, though, when they're thinking about what to spend, they're running out of money because there was such a big burst in demand and they had to pay for it all. They made a little bit more money, but we know that wage inflation didn't keep up with inflation. So 
even though they wanted to go out and do all this stuff, it was almost a lot of like keeping up with the Joneses, yeah. right? So and so is doing that. I want to do it too. Nobody wanted to go back on on what they had committed to. So I think they're running out of money and had spent so much on credit cards that now we're in this spot where it looks like it's slowing down, but I think it's actually getting back to regular. Yeah, and it's important to try to figure out how we got here. Like, what was the impetus to get here? And I think it's a lot of this stuff started in the 1980s, but in earnest, it started with the great financial crisis when the Federal Reserve came in, flooded the system with liquidity, took rates down to levels, again, that we haven't seen historically, and they did what was needed to be done at the time. And you can't do the counterfactual, but in a lot of ways, maybe to save the capitalist way of living, right? The, our economy in essence. The problem, of course, is um, those rates were kept low for an inordinate amount of time. And as the Federal Reserve and other people were begging for inflation, people living out here in the United States were saying, what are you talking about? Why are you begging for inflation? My cost of living is going up. My health care is going up. My shelter is going up. Education is clearly going up. Inflation was rampant for a lot of people. Yet the Federal Reserve kept asking for it. We need inflation. We need inflation. And we've talked about this a number of times. Be careful what you wish for because you're going to get it. And I think what wound up happening, in my opinion, is the inflation that they begged for and thought they could control came in spades. And we saw levels that we hadn't seen in decades last summer. I think CPI topped out at 9.1% in June of last year. This is 1970 stuff. So now they have to backtrack, right? Now they have to fix the problem that they created. And they're doing so by raising rates in a very speedy way in levels that we haven't seen again in quite some time. So, so now we're at levels, the Fed's trying to combat inflation, but by doing so, they're creating all other kinds of problems. So, some folks, Liz, would say that the Fed has combated it. They've, they've kind of taken their medicine. They're trying to right the ills that you just described in a way, because again, you can't prove counterfactuals. The Fed did what they thought they needed to do in 08, 09, mm -hmm. and 10. The problem, I think you would say, Guy, is that they just kept on doing it for years and years. And we go back to like 2013. Remember the taper tantrum when they're going to stop all the easy monetary policy? Stock market didn't even really sell off that much when they started to talk about normalizing interest rates. So when you think about where we are now, is there some way to like literally say if we could take a step back and maybe put ourselves, you know, maybe a year or two in the future, is there a chance that the Fed maybe did combat a really weird inflationary environment? When you talk about the pandemic, you talk about this war in Russia and what that did to natural resources. You talk about deglobalization and this move away from China. Um, you know, these are all inflationary sort of things. But are we looking at it maybe too um, granularly? You know what I mean? Like if we mm -hmm. kind of take a step back or pull away a little bit, is there a way to say, well, maybe the Fed is actually right sizing their monetary policy for what might be a new world order going forward? Well, OK, let's back up a little bit. So Guy mentioned the Fed wanting inflation. And, and let's be clear, there is sort of a sweet spot of inflation from somewhere between one and three percent where the stock market tends to do OK. Between one and three percent indicates that there's healthy demand in the economy. People are still out there spending money. They're employed. So we do want some inflation. And we had been running at below normal inflation for a very long time. So that's sort of where that desire for inflation comes in. You never want it to be zero. For what the Fed is doing, they can only control really the demand of the economy. They can control the money that's flowing out in the economy that people then have to go spend on stuff and, and services, right? They can't control the bottlenecks that happened. Mm -hmm. They can't control the availability of workers at Starbucks, right? They can only control how much people are going to buy and how much people are going to spend because they take back what is flooded in the system. A normalization of policy, yes, needs to occur because what we've seen for the last 10 to 15 years is just completely not normal. And just to take a step back, because it causes asset bubbles, right? right. So we can go back for right. 20 years. Remember, the housing crisis was caused by unusually low rates that were to combat the recession in the post-dot-com implosion, right? Right. And then... We kept them too low after the financial crisis when they went back to zero. And then we created a whole list of other different bubbles. And then during the pandemic again. Well, and to explain that even more. So what happens is the Fed puts too much money in the system. The way it creates bubbles is people take too much risk because it seems as if risk is nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. So then there's this complete mismatch of the risk appetite that somebody really should have and, and what they're actually doing. So then you have over risking, which creates bubbles and then it bursts and blah, 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 blah. Right. So 
what happened for the last 10 to 15 years is it hasn't been normal, but it's not a matter of just, okay, let's just put rates up to where they should be, let inflation run where it should be. The problem now is that we're all conditioned to believe that they will sweep in and save the day, that they will prevent anything more than a 20% drawdown. And even if there is more than a 20% drawdown, we saw in COVID a 34% drawdown, that they'll save that too by now buying securities, right? Buying bond ETFs, making sure the market functions properly. So any investor that's new since COVID believes, I think, that there's no such thing as a 58% drawdown like what we saw in 2008, because they'll just save it before we get there. And that's the part that I think is almost impossible to retrain without it occurring. So Guy, talk to me. So when Liz talks about drawdowns, she's talking about the stock market. Um, you think, and, and you've made this uh, point on many occasions, not after the fact, you've kind of made it before the fact, is that you know consumer confidence mm -hmm. oftentimes is, is basically an overlay of the S&P 500 stock chart. We think about the wealth effect, at least in the last 20 years, that has been created by the housing market, by the stock market, that sort of thing. Talk to us a little bit about that, because right now, some of the consumer readings are starting to roll over a little bit. Which is perfect for this room. So yeah. you know, a lot of CMOs here today, consumer as Liz mentioned, is the driving force of the United States economy, which in essence is the driving force of the global economy. And what I've said and what I've learned the hard way over years, but I've learned it, is you never underestimate the U.S. consumers want to spend. They will spend seemingly under any circumstances that we can come up with. How do they get spooked? Well, again, to your point, Dan, my opinion is they get spooked when there are events in the stock market. Not to suggest that everybody owns stocks. That's not my point at all. I understand that that's not the case. But when Dan Rather or Peter Jennings starts the evening news at six o'clock with the stock market today was down one and a half, two percent. And when they see it over the course of a few days, then they say to themselves, wait a second, the stock market is the economy. Clearly, the economy must be doing poorly if we're in this sort of move lower in the stock market. Maybe I should reconsider going on that vacation or buying that car or buying that Starbucks. And then consumer behavior starts to kick in the other way. So when you have stock market events, typically the consumer stops on a dime. And I'll give you a good example. In the fall of 2018, the stock market from a Halloween until Christmas went down almost 20%. Consumer spending stopped on a dime for no other reason than the market went lower and it spooked a lot of people. Now, I'm not saying we're on the precipice of that, but clearly there are things in going on right now that are alarming the consumer. And if we were to have a stock market move, I think consumer spending would all but stop. Well, it's interesting. Some of the housing data, Liz, um, suggests that prices are still pretty good. We haven't seen it really yeah. turn. We've seen activity slow because the pace of the increase in mortgage rates. But are we seeing people tap home equity loans at these sorts of levels, which you might have yeah. seen with rates being lower, that sort of thing? And so I'm just curious. It's like, where are the different pockets that the consumer can, can you know, at a time? And, and we, we should talk a little bit about this because I know at SoFi you do a lot of survey work among your members and that sort of thing. We know that, you know, there's been a moratorium on student loans for, what, three years or something like that. Now they're going to start getting paid back. And so it just seems like there's a lot of headwinds to consumer spending. And I'm just curious. Are there some things that maybe, you know, are, are, are decent tailwinds? You know, we still have unemployment yeah. below 4%, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, it's Lester Holt on the evening. Lester news, Holt. I'm pretty yes, sure. That's the it, most right trusted right. man in Ga America. Guy is trapped in 1988. I'm pretty sure, <laughs> in 1988. I'm pretty sure he's yeah. the most trusted yeah. man in America. Yeah, anyway, I'm a Lester fan. Yeah. So, okay, we'll start with housing. Uh, yes, home prices are high, but housing is one of those asset classes or one of those things that you buy that it's only worth as much as somebody will pay for it. Yeah. There haven't been a lot of transactions in existing homes because everybody's locked into a three and a half percent mortgage. Who in their right mind would go choose to start a new mortgage at seven and a quarter, right? So everybody's just staying home and doing whatever they can and not, we don't have houses changing hands. So there's no mark to market that really tells us how much those houses are worth. Can I make one point? It's interesting. During the pandemic, when there wasn't a lot of, there was a little burst in activity, but but stocks like Home Depot and Lowe's traded mm -hmm. very well. well. And, yeah. and, and uh, uh, William Sonoma and Restoration Hardware, and those stocks have all retraced. A, a lot of those kind of, you know, 
those moves that they had. Now, Home Depot, and this is a, a stock market thing for you folks. I mean, just drop below his 200 day moving average. It, it just tells you that, like, it, you know, the positive sentiment is waning a little bit. I would have thought in this environment with rates, mortgage rates this high and not a lot of activity, that maybe you would go back to fixing up your home, the, the home that you're in, if you were thinking about trading up, but you don't want to right now because you yeah. don't want to trade out of your three and a half percent mortgage for a seven percent mortgage. Well, I think it's totally different, though. You're just not home as much anymore. Yeah. That was when we were stuck at home staring at the walls, right? I mean, I bought art in the pandemic just because yeah. I was like, I've been in this room did. for so long. I yeah. got to change something, yeah. right? Right now what we're seeing, and, and I actually heard this yesterday. Don't quote me on the numbers, but I think I'm roughly accurate. It used to be that 40% of New York office space was vacant. Now it's down to like 27%. So people are coming yeah. back and people are leaving their home again. So there's not as much money to be spent on that. I would guess then, you know, well, not even guess. I know for sure transportation costs have gone up, right? Public transportation has gone up. You've got people that have to commute now. So that's been a bigger bite out of consumers' pocketbooks. And you've got people that are back in the office, back at lunches, right? So there's just a shift in where the spending is. And I think those the Home Depots of the world and all the housing adjacent stocks saw their heyday yeah. 2020, 2021, when everybody was stuck at home. I don't think they're going to see that heyday again. Add on top of that, what we talk about with the consumer, one of the first indications that they're slowing down is you watch durable goods, mm -hmm. which is bigger ticket items, washing machines, whatever. Home Depot depends on that as sales as well. Well, if everybody already did it, they're not going to replace it all again. And as durable goods slow down after that, you see retail slow down and everybody just sort of hits the pause button. There's something going on with the consumer as well, the U.S. consumer. And don't quote me on the exact number, but Walmart, for example, which is still the largest retailer out there, I think, 70% um, of their customer base now earns $100,000 or more, which is a staggering number. And if we sit here today, not to play stock market, but Walmart's one of the few retailers that's doing extraordinarily well in terms of their stock as we're sitting here, what's in a whisper of an all-time high. Good for Walmart. The flip side of that coin, though, are sort of the lower-end retailers, five below, for example, Dollar General, Dollar Tree. All those companies are making multi-year lows in terms of the stock. So historically, when you've seen a trade down, you see, you see consumers trading down to a Dollar Tree, to a Dollar Gen. Now they're trading down from those companies. And the question you have to ask yourself in your seats is, where are they going? So when you have this chasm between a target, which is, and a lot of targets problems granted are target created or self-inflicted wounds. But when you see this chasm between the lower end and a Walmart, something is clearly going on. I mean, this is seemingly a sea change. I don't know how long it's going to last, but the, the ground is moving beneath a lot of feet right now. Well, let's talk, and you said self-inflicted wounds in some of these retailers. It was about inventories. It was about changing consumer demand and, 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 and the like here. But when we think about like consumer staples, and this was a, a really good story, at least if you were an investor in consumer staples for a while, their ability to pass on increases in shipping costs and increases in a whole host of wages and the like. And, and that we're seeing, you know, huge pricing growth, but it wasn't, you know, it was just basically passed. They're, they're not having that same ability, Liz, to do that right now. Is that one of the reasons why you think that we hit kind of peak margins in some of these kind of consumer areas, staples in particular? At least that's what's being perceived through the stock market, at least the price action over the last couple of months in consumer staples. Yeah, I mean, you can't use it as an excuse anymore, yeah. right? It doesn't make any more sense. My Frosted Flakes still taste like Frosted Flakes. I'm not going to pay more for them because now I know that inflation has come back down. It's not as hot as it was last summer. So you can't justify a pricing increase for a product that has not changed, right? I got a smoothie the other day and that, I mean, it was already overpriced, Lose but a bit. no, <laughs> I love smoothies. Usually it, for, I don't know how many months it was $11 and something, right? I go yesterday. Wait, wait, wait. I know it's overpriced. Oh, so, I get so for, it. Your smoothie was over $11. Yes. Yes. I, so far high. I was, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, used, I'm sorry. I was used to paying that. I go and yesterday it was $12 even. And I was like, oh, cute. You guys just round it up, yeah. right? And we're all supposed to be okay with that. And then I wondered how many times have you done that before? I just happen to notice now because it changed from an 11 to a 12. It's the same smoothie, right? It doesn't taste any different than last time. And now I'm angry, right? And I was like ready to yell at the girl that checked me out. It's not her decision to raise no. the prices. But that's just, I think everybody's feeling that, right? You're paying more for smaller boxes. That's right. That's the same product and it's no longer justifiable. 
So the idea of just simple math, if you expect earnings to be up 10% in 2024, which is what consensus believes, right? And that margins will either stay as good as they are or even expand, revenues have to come down from where they were in 2023, which means in order to maintain your margin, right? It's just top minus costs equals bottom. You have to cut costs. We've cut costs everywhere. So the next place to cut them is the labor market, which means at some point you see job losses. And that's when the consumer stops spending. It's interesting. We talk about the codes that companies use. So first of all, you don't need frosted flakes. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Shot. I don't. <laughs> I'm a special K person, know as you that, know. Yeah. I won't get into the reasons that I can't eat Cheerios well. because it's lunchtime here and Proper decorum prohibits me, although I do love Cheerios. But when you hear Kellogg's talk about 14 15% organic growth, it basically means that they're layering on their cost to the consumer. They're not growing at all. They're just passing on that cost. What you're going to see to your point and your point as well, there comes a level where they no longer can do that. And we have absolutely reached that. People are just saying, no, Moss, it can't happen. So this shrinkflation that goes on to your point, from a 16 ounce box of cereal to a 14 ounce at the same price, that will continue. But the consumer is starting to wisen up. So these companies that have enjoyed that for so long, General Mills, Kellogg's, names like that, I think we're at a point where they no longer can pass on that cost. And that's problematic as well. So they've enjoyed this arena, this environment for the last few years. The pendulum is starting to go the other way. All right. I want to go back to retailers for a second because I think this is a really interesting topic. So Costco reported this week. Um, we had Walmart last month. Guy, you just mentioned that Walmart is trading very near an all-time high. Costco is trading very near an all-time high. When you think about um, even Amazon in their results, their Q2 results that they reported, I think in late July or early August, I mean, they showed, you know, uh, operating margin improvement for the first time in the retail business in a while. That was one of the things driving it. So all of a sudden, it like, you know, Amazon was the bugaboo. Well, Walmart was the bugaboo all during the 90s, right? If you think about like, and, and they kind of had a bad rap for a while. And then Amazon came onto this and they like took over a little bit. I don't know why Costco feels like a, uh, like a kinder, gentler, big boxy sort of big brother, if you will. Um, but these three companies are really flexing right now. And when you think about Amazon taking 50% of every incremental e-commerce dollar, and then if you just do what we do and you look at the charts, Guy mentioned these dollar stores, you know, the list goes on and on, all these um, department stores, they are falling off of what we call the bottom right, whether it's a one-year basis or a five-year basis. And listen, the stock price doesn't always dictate the health of a company and, and their earnings potential, but oftentimes it does. You know what I mean? So Let's talk about this concentration among these big box or these e-commerce behemoths because Walmart is emerging as mm -hmm. one right now too, guys. Costco should do well theoretically in any environment. And I say the definite, if you want to see wishful thinking, and I've said this to Elizabeth before, <laughs> yeah. go to a Costco and watch some 80-year-old dude buy like 24 rolls of toilet paper. I mean, that is wishful thinking <laughs> at the highest level. Good for him, by the way. I wish I had that kind of constitution. And Costco doesn't seem to have the sort of the, what do they call it, shrinkage now when you're getting ripped off? It's harder to get into Costco than it is. You, they, you have to show, if you don't have your little Costco card, they don't want you in. No. So by definition, I mean, if they want you in, they ain't letting you out if you're trying to rip the place off. So they seem to run the place a lot better. Target's closing nine stores now in the United States, one here in New York City because of theft. So there's a problem going on with that that's completely separate to the conversation we're having. But Costco wins in this environment without question. When people are looking for value, that's where they're going. And Walmart, you can still find it. The environment doesn't lend itself to sort of the, if you're in the middle in retail, you're in no man's land. Yeah. And that's where a lot of these stores find themselves. You want to be on the very high end, which seemingly continues to do well, or sort of the other side of that equation. And in being in the middle, it's, it's in this environment with higher interest rates, it's not a place to be. Yeah, Liz, so, so here at, at Zeta Live, there's like, hundreds of, of marketing professionals here, okay, and work with all different sorts of brands, and they're trying to figure out how to use all different sorts of technology to access different demographics and the like. I think a lot of folks are very interested in, like, your demographic at SoFi and the members that oh, you not have. Me. Well, not well, me. Not me in particular. Well, they're interested in you. I mean, <laughs> we've, by the way, not the people, but we've created, like, me, like me and you. Elizabeth, my, she now is EY from so oh, right, 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 I've right. seen it happen in real yes, life. Yes. I mean, people walk up to her and say, you're EY from so we've, we've created, I don't say a monster, but it's like, <laughs> it's, it's, a, bit, it's anyway, a bit of that. Please continue. But, but, so you talk to a lot of your members. These are all, um, 
uh, college educated in their 20s and 30s, right? They have disposable um, income that they're investing. Um, they're, they're doing mortgages with you. They're refinancing student loans, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about like a little bit of the, the survey work you're seeing in, in, in incorporating a lot of the themes that we've kind of talked about over the last 20 minutes or so, because yeah. I think a lot of folks here are, are really interested in this demo. I mean, we certainly are. And we think about it like the, the content that we create and, and the audience that we have, you know, through um, CNBC or uh, Rich Girls for Media. I mean, we're always thinking about how do we push a little bit younger, you know what I mean? And because this is this is like a, an emerging, you know, people talk about the Chinese emerging middle class. I mean, your demo is a demo that a lot of folks here want to really figure out how to reach. Yeah. So to, to make it more specific, we call them high earners, not well served. And it's that middle ground of maybe you're young, so you don't have a lot of assets yet. You don't have enough to meet a minimum for, with a financial advisor. You don't feel wealthy enough to go use certain types of financial services. Or you're a high earner, meaning you're earning more than six figures, but you've never really invested before. So you're new at this and you're not well served because there's not a good product set out there for you that matches your needs. So we're trying to fill that gap and and provide the products that those people want. The other thing about it is on our invest platform, about 66% of the investors on that platform are between the ages of 20 and 40. So they're building wealth, they're buying individual stocks. And one of the things that was comforting to me this year was that, so we have a, a ETF called the SoFi Social 50 and it tracks the 50 most widely held stocks on our platform. And I always look at the top 10 and it's everything you would expect. It's the headline makers, it's big tech, right? Amazon's in there, Microsoft, Tesla, all everything you would expect. And it had been that for a while. There's also a lot of disruptors in there. They want to own Rivian and you know the disruptive stocks, weed stocks, I'm oh, sorry, cannabis, I yeah. guess is what it's called. Um, and then at some point, about midway through the year, number 10 on that list was a company that I had never seen on that list before. And it was Berkshire Hathaway. And suddenly it was like, oh, Warren Buffett still matters, even though he's really old, right? And Charlie Munger's even older, but it still matters. She's they're laughing. Young, I'm not. It says, I'm not that freaking old. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, next to those guys, you look like a spring chicken. But I mean, I mean it is amazing. I mean, like those two guys. They are yeah. both. Are they almost ninety ish or something. Charlie's like over. Munger's. Yeah, I mean, he's mid nineties. He looks like one of the dudes like in that mo- in, in Poltergeist. You yeah. Remember Poltergeist? Anybody remember Poltergeist? That of scary old bastard. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry. Well, you know, it's I, funny, but Charlie's here. I apologize. One of, one of my better. <laughs> one of my one of my better jokes. Just you know, on Fast Money, every once in a while. <laughs> I don't do it too frequently, but we'll. Talk Talking about the Dow transports, you know, the, 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 the Dow theory uh-huh, that if uh-huh. the transports have to confirm the move in the industrials. And I'll say, when you and Charlie Dow, your yeah, freshman year, and you're, you're, you know, in, in, no, in, in, in grade school. In grade school. Uh, sorry, Liz, go, go back. Uh, so, okay. Berkshire Hathaway shows up in the yeah. top 10, and it's refreshing because it's like, oh, yeah. young people know who, who Warren Buffett is and they care. And they, it also reaffirmed that maybe they're diversifying the portfolio away from some of that stuff, yeah. right? We had a pullback in the market, they got smart about it, and they decided to maybe take some education or take some advice and say, you know what, maybe I should invest in some of the stuff that seems not so sexy anymore. Yeah. So that's a good thing. We also did a survey at the end of last year after the big pullback that asked our members, how much are you going to invest next year? The same amount, more, even after this bear market. And most of them, I think it was 74% of them, said they would invest the same amount or more, regardless of the bear market. Also encouraging, right? So they're still understanding that there's a long-term time horizon, but they are affected by marketing. They are affected by headlines. And they, I, have, I have this saying I've been using lately. They have this, like, the fallacy of familiarity, right? I'm familiar with Apple because mm-hmm. I mean, I probably have four Apple devices with me today. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right stock for me to concentrate my portfolio in, right? Yeah. But there's all this familiarity with big tech and then we're all concentrated well, in that. While stock. you're on Apple, it's, it, it's interesting. I mean, what percentage of Berkshire's hat holdings are now Apple when, mm-hmm. when you think about it. I mean, mm-hmm. and so I, you know, we're kind of overexposed. I think that's one thing that the guy, you mentioned this a lot. I mean, you know, how many ETFs is Apple in? Well, Apple's become its own asset class. So don't quote me, but if I go to my Google machine, I think Apple in 347 ETFs is one of the top 15, one five holdings. So in a lot of ways, it's become its own sort of sector yeah. if you think about well, it's it bigger than the entire russell 2000 and good, small caps index and good for apple and that's great when passive money flows in apple will win to that regardless of any apple stories now of course there's a flip side of that coin quickly that we're seeing an apple which is an expensive stock on valuation 
which has been slowing over the last three quarters, which trades its single, you know, single digit EPS growth, single digit revenue growth, margins that have stabilized or contracting, that's not necessarily a good thing. And if the money starts to flow out of the market for whatever reason, the way Apple went on the upside, it will lose on the downside. Not to mention the fact that the Chinese within the last three weeks or so basically banned Apple devices from their government employees, which is not a good thing. And the next step would be for them to shadow ban the Apple products in the entire country, which is not out of the realm of possibility. So that's just something to keep in mind. We've gone 30 minutes now. You also have to mention what's going on in the energy market yeah. because, you know, a few months ago, crude oil was $65 and we were sort of doing back handsprings that maybe gas prices would start coming down in a meaningful way. Maybe that input inflation would continue to go down. And as we're sitting here today, it's some $30 higher, around $95. And there are people out West paying $6 for a ga gallon of gas. That's a problem. Nobody seems to care that they're buying their Starbucks costs another 35 cents, but God forbid gasoline yeah. goes up and everybody takes notice. And that's a behavioral finance thing as well. Yeah. Let's talk, why has this happened? Because if we think about the data out of China, which mm -hmm. is a huge buyer of, of crude and, and, and generally when things are rip warring, it's, it's about their demand. Mm -hmm. The data is bad. I mean, like their economy is not doing particularly well. It feels like they are on the precipice of a credit crisis. We've all, we've been tracking what's been going on um, with Evergrande and, and the defaults that they've had there. Um, you know, so, you know, Europe is in a recessionary environment. Like, why is crude oil gone from, to Guy's point, 65 to 95 and what feels like a straight line over three months when all the data, you know, globally seems like we have a weakening economy here. And so is it structural? Like what's going on there in your opinion? Well, that would suggest that it's just demand based and, and really the rise has been supply constraints mm -hmm. recently. And, you know, the other thing to watch about oil is that it's one of the things that spikes before the rest of the world crashes. So a rise in oil prices is not always indicative of healthy demand, healthy movement. It's not indicative of a uh, healthy global economy necessarily, especially when the rise has been driven by supply, not demand. It also could be, I mean, obviously it's driven inflation too. And the thing that continues to irk me, always irks me, I've talked about this on the show and on the podcast, I'm sure, when we talk about inflation, we talk about core inflation as the Fed's measure. And it's like they took this basket of stuff and said, well, that's going to cause a problem. Let's take it out. That's going to cause a problem. Let's take it out. But the reality is, as a consumer, I mean, I buy energy on the daily. Mm -hmm. I buy food on the daily, right? I have to live somewhere. You can't just take it all out and say, oh, inflation is fine because we're just not going to measure that stuff that's an issue. And energy is one of those things that they continue to say, well, it's too volatile. It's affected by things outside our control. Yes, of course it is. But it's also something that is affecting everybody in America and everybody around the globe. So I think the energy price thing is, is probably more of a warning sign than something to get excited about. And I don't think that we should look at it as, oh, this is in contrast to the fact that the globe is slowing. Yeah. I think it's the idea that supply is being constrained so that companies can still make money doing so, it. Do, Guy, do you agree with that? Because I remember back in 08 where we were firmly in a financial crisis here. And there was lots of stimulus that was already put in place here to stabilize the banking system and stabilize consumer balance sheets and the like. And I do remember the move in crude oil. I, it did, didn't get to, in 08. Up Teens. To, no, but it got as high. Oh, when, yeah. First, it spiked, I think, to 135 or something yeah. like People that. People were calling for $200 oil. Yeah. And then next thing you know, you wake up one morning, yeah. it's back down in the 20s. It's remarkable how volatile it is. Do I agree? I do think it's a supply side thing, which actually sort of makes it a little bit worse because at some point demand's going to start to kick in. You mentioned the eurozone. People say, "Why is Europe a big deal?" It's not individually; the countries are not a big deal. Yeah. Collectively, the eurozone is actually a bigger economy and more people in the United States, which is still the biggest economy in the world. So it is a big deal, and they're clearly having issues, and they have a bigger inflation problem that we have that they're continuing to try to combat. China's a fascinating story because, as you also mentioned, they are clearly slowing down. The flip side of that coin is they've been stockpiling all kinds of things. And the question you have to ask yourself is, listen, they have done that historically. They seemingly are doing it now at a greater level, stockpiling commodities, stockpiling crude oil. The question is, what are they getting prepared for? And that's something I think that should be concerning. And I'm not trying to be an alarmist here, but if you start to sort of read the tea leaves, you know, things are starting to look a little interesting in terms of what potentially could happen between China and Taiwan. The same way, if you read the tea leaves a few years ago, 
it was pretty, pretty clear when the Russians were amassing troops on the border that they weren't doing that for sightseeing tour. They were obviously going to do something. So the world's sort of a scary place here. And, you know, that go goes back to when you're a CMO, when you're talking to your consumers or trying to understand what consumer behavior is, what's the thing that's going to trigger yeah. those consumers? What's going to make them spend or what's going to make them say, you know what? Maybe we should sort of stop here for a minute. That, I mean, that's a great segue. So the precedent that was set by many U.S. multinationals when Russia invaded Ukraine was to pull out of Russia, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you think about China, it's a really complicated situation. Many of those companies would tell you, yeah, Russia was like 1% or 2% of our revenue. If that. If that, right? So, but, so here we are. A lot of U.S. multinationals rely on China for uh, manufacturing. Um, obviously, in, in the case of many, for natural resources, if you're an EV maker, you care about access to rare earth materials. You get, and then most importantly is access to that rising middle class, mm -hmm. right? And so all of a sudden now, and you mentioned a guy with Apple, it's like, okay, so we're going to have a little tit for tat here, right? Well, you know, we're going to ban TikTok. Again, that, it hasn't been done, but, but um, if we are going to go down that road, then if they see us already pulling out manufacturing to diversify for national security reasons, right? So think about during the pandemic, our reliance on China and their zero COVID policy really created crazy bottlenecks. And it really helped create a lot of the inflation and consumer goods that we're talking about. So we're going to diversify away that this Apple iPhone 15 was the first one that has been shipped from a country, I think, other than China. It came from uh, India, and we're going to see them from uh, Vietnam. Does the Chinese, or do the Chinese, do they care less? Do they start doing the sorts of things with the shadow bands and that sort of, the, you know, of our goods, um, if we're going to be pulling manufacturing away from there? And what does that mean for U.S. multinationals? Liz? Well, I think if we compare it to Russia, first of all, we have much less control over yeah. this piece, right? We could pull out of Russia. And, and if the biggest risk with the Russia-Ukraine situation was energy, we had become so much more energy independent by the time that war broke out that we could completely give up any energy that we had been getting from there and still be okay and not really affect our economy too much. We got more affected by the breadbasket, the wheat stuff, the, the food prices that changed. We are not China independent. And that was a, a situation, Russia-Ukraine was a situation that was happening over there, they weren't necessarily taking things away from us, right? We were putting the screws to them. This is a situation where maybe it's both ways. China's taking things away from us and we're taking things away from them. And the, just the interlocking pieces of our economy, that's not going to happen smoothly. And the onshoring stuff, yeah, it's happening. I think we've all, we've confirmed that. Slowly, and, it feels but like. I mean, it there's takes, lots of It takes incentives. like a decade, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. you got to build plants before you can start yeah using the plants and you got to hire people to fill the plants before you can start using the plants. And we're already in a tight labor market, right? So it's going to take a long time and China can affect our economy with one statement. Mm -hmm. So we just, we don't have control over this. I'm not saying it's going to blow up into a huge issue. I'm not saying that that's going to be the catalyst that takes us down. Yeah. It could be, but it's a bigger risk because we are not in control and we are so much more dependent. If you're in a CMO seat now, I mean, the precedent has been set with Russia, companies pulling out. That was an easy do for many companies. It wasn't going to really affect their bottom line. But you have to be thinking, God forbid something were to happen between China and Taiwan. What is the first thing we do? What is the reaction going to be? And that's going to, I'm telling you, that first reaction that companies make, that's going to be critical in terms of how the market perceives them. For Apple, it's a really tough do, right? It's easy to pull out of Russia. China is a little bit different, but, you know, the, with the precedent already being set, if they were not to do and pull out of China, the market's not going to reward them. As a matter of fact, there's going to be a lot of blowback. And if they were to pull out, that's obviously going to hurt the bottom line. So we're really in some strange times in terms of what potentially could be happening. But when you're sitting in those seats, you know, I grew up in a Wall Street, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. And to a certain extent, I think that's the same way you have to be in those CMO seats as yeah, well. It's interesting because obviously our digital companies really don't have access to, to Chinese consumers for the most part. And it really is about, um, you know, manufacturing there. I think 50 percent of Tesla's manufacturing is happening in Shanghai right now. And when it's interesting, when you think about Tesla's market share in North America, it's above 50 percent for EVs, but it's much lower in China. And they have a lot of competition by like local manufacturers there. And so you think about, you know, 
the Chinese coming at Apple first, guy, you and I have talked about this, I feel like, for years, was kind of interesting that they literally, that was the first salvo in this tit for tat a little bit. But you look at a company like Tesla and you say to yourself, okay, they need access to those consumers. They need the manufacturing there. They need their supply chains oriented there for rare earth materials and the like. There's a lot of like tape bombs out there, Liz, for, for some U.S. companies on multiple levels here. And I'm just curious because, um, you know, we, when you think about it, I mean, is this likely, you know, Guy just said, you know, late 2021, you know, the Russians weren't amassing, you know, the forces on the border of Ukraine for mm -hmm. shits and giggles. I mean, they actually did the thing. Mm -hmm. And it really feels like, if you're reading the tea leaves that they're the weaker the economy gets in China, the more likely. And I think that's kind of also what you're saying, guy. at least some provocation. Maybe it starts with some sort of economic blockade or something like that. Thoughts. How, how does that work into your your economic and financial worldview for 2024? Yeah, well, as it, it, it always starts slowly. Right. And it's I think right now it started slowly. If Apple was the first headline, then maybe there's a next one that's a headline. And we'll explain it away and say, well, that's an idiosyncratic problem for that company. They'll figure that out. Maybe the stock price gets hit, but the broad market doesn't get hit. Once they start piling up and then you've got five headlines in the same sector, you've got 10 headlines and China is taking stuff away across sectors and it's affecting bottom lines of companies in multiple places, then it becomes a sentiment thing here. Then it becomes it's taking the stock market down because those big companies that we thought, what do we call them, our generals or whatever, mm -hmm. because the generals went down. If the generals are going down for something that's completely outside our control as an investor, I'm probably a little spooked, right? I don't want to hold it if I can't control or have visibility into what it's going to look like for the next few quarters. So then it becomes a sentiment thing and you're guilty by association. It's going to be a while, I think, before that happens. And we need a few more headlines for that to actually occur. But it started, right? And there's even stuff going on in the market today, very broadly, that quietly things aren't going well, right? You've got the number of stocks trading above their 200-day moving average falling. You've got the number of stocks looking oversold rising. You've got the 50-day moving average rolling over and now moving downward, right? Those are quiet little signals that at first blush and even put together today don't send alarm bells. The Apple headline doesn't necessarily send alarm bells. But if we look back on it in a year or two and say, well, that was just the first one. It was the first of seven, right? Then you realize that, okay, maybe I should have paid more attention when it started. We have a couple minutes and otherwise we'll, we'll sort of let you folks go. But if anybody has any questions, now's the time to raise your hand. We'll answer anything you want. If not, yes, sir. India is definitely, I mean, if you read, which obviously you have, I mean, that's been a lot of the rhetoric's been around India in, in a smaller way, Vietnam, some other places in Southeast Asia, but India is a logical choice, but there's some concerns along that as well. And as Elizabeth mentioned, you don't just, and I know you know this, but you can't just flip a switch and go from mainland China to India overnight. It requires a lot of work and a lot of dollars, but we're headed that way. I think company sees what's going on, but the question is, the time between here and then to get there, what's going to happen? And I think it's sort of messy along that route. Well, speaking of messy, I mean, our, our democracy is pretty messy here. And it's interesting <laughs> that a lot of our reliance for offshore manufacturing is with, you know, non-democratic sort of uh, companies or, or countries, or at least India, that seems to be, uh, you know, in a bent under Modi. And, and again, I don't mean that to be a political thing. It just seems like that is where your question is coming from, too. And um, it seems like uh, our our, com our countries don't have too much of a problem with it. Uh, Biden just uh, met with MBS in the last few months after labeling him something, you know, not particularly, um, you know, yeah. savory. Well, listen, we've sent over the course of the last four or five months, we've sent four people to China. Yeah. Gina Raimondo, Janet Yellen, uh, John Kerry, and Blinken to try to sort of assuage and try to sort of temper things down. And each time that they have left, something else has escalated. So it's clear 
Look, again, I don't want to be alarmist here, but the relationship we have with China is probably the worst it's been in five decades. No doubt. I, listen, we are coming up on our time. We really appreciate everyone being here. We appreciate Liz Young joining us in person. Uh, Zeta Global, uh, amazing event. David Steinberg and the whole team, thank you very much for having Guy, Liz, and myself here. Obviously, thanks to SoFi for being a sponsor of Market Call and, of course, our, our data provider, FactSet, which is all this- Financial data and analytics powered, powered by, by tomorrow. tomorrow. Um, please uh, enjoy the rest of the day here come up and say hi. We're going to be around for a little bit. So Thanks, thank everyone. You guys, thank you. Thank you.